<clears throat> Katie, why don't we have you kick off and go first? We can both kind of talk about our roles and our companies, but um, can you just give everyone a little bit of background on your role as head of digital marketing and on Harmon as well? Yeah, so Harmon is a connected technologies company. So uh, most uh, consumers may recognize brands like GBL and Harmon Kardon uh, from an audio standpoint, but a big crux of the business is also around automotive and um, connected technologies there. So thinking about, you know, what the future of driving is, but also what, you know, the future of cities could be and things like that. So um, Harman uh, has been around, I mean, for GBL, it's been around for, for 75 years. Um, and, and my role really is uh, leading digital, social, and then also paid media. So from strategy to execution um, around brands that you see uh, in stores like a Best Buy or a Target. So think portable speakers, think headphones, think um, home audio, uh, connected sound bars, things like that. Uh, and, and my role is really uh, helping uh, bridge that gap for the brand and also in culture. Um, and uh, do some really uh, innovative and different thinking uh, type campaigns uh, around uh, our products, but also just around our brand. Um, as we know, the, the world is constantly changing. Um, the country is constantly changing. There's a lot of different um, conversations going on and, and how GBL can play uh, a really active role in that. Um, and how we can elevate experiences for consumers really around audio and music. Great, yeah, thanks for that intro. And I, I it's interesting, I haven't, um, Eva, but I, I have memories of Harmon as a brand from my earliest days of as being a car owner when I was you know, a late teenager. And, and I think the, uh, well, some of the original uh, faceplate, um, uh, uh, technology that came yeah. out that was uh, so that, that's great and I've, I've been eager to chat with you so um, just for everyone in the audience so uh, Neutronian is be an interesting dialogue because Neutronian um, Katie with your perspective on on social and digital channels uh, Neutronian is a uh, platform company that creates a, a quality score or almost like a bond rating for audience data so our our goal is to be Kind of like the Moody's of, of marketing tech uh, audience information. And as I think all of it, many of us in the audience have started to think about <clears throat> different data marketplaces. And I'm sure Katie, as you think about how you look at your customer base and there's obviously by, you know, generational mix, but all the different attributes that go into that, um, you know, we've, we've wanted to bring a quality rating to not only, you know, is this uh, your typical age, gender, household income breakdown, but by, generation millennial gen z but then getting into things like are these um these ids that we're looking at really uh you know midwest based sports enthusiasts auto intenders uh you know for example so that's been our focus and we've grown a ton we work with uh, platforms like uh, omni omnicom and great um agency brands like goodway group etc and with uh you know top data providers like uh bombora on the b2b side and uh, share this, which does some social analytics and affinity that does that. So that's our overview on Neutronian. And my background is in audience verification and in um, uh, the activation space. So sure. it's be a great conversation. I'm looking forward to, to having a chat with you. But can you can you talk a little bit about that? You know, how are how are you looking at your your outreach? And I think maybe just how are things shifting between. I don't know that, you know, I'm Gen X, uh, you've got millennials and then, you know, but I think Gen Z is a real, you know, focus point now. So how have you seen that evolve and what's, what's your, um, you and Harmon's, you know, perspective on that? Yeah, well, I think what we're seeing with Gen Z is compared to millennials is uh, Gen Z really wants to be part of the conversation. They want to create the conversation. They also want to create content, right? And um, from a millennial perspective, and I'm kind of on that tail end of, of the millennial group here, but you kind of get ads and you get them served up to you or you get content and they get served up to you in your feed and that's really kind of it and that's how you consume. I think what Gen Z has been doing, not only just thinking through things like societal changes and you know, um, 
um, you know, being, uh, making sure that brands are taking stances that align with their values, but they also want to create the content for the brands as well. Um, so it's not just um, always a matter of right place, right time, right target. It has to really feel much more meaningful and much more one-to-one -to, -one to them. And what we've really taken a look at, um, especially on the GBL side, is how can we look at Gen Z, which is, you know, really what a lot of brands are looking at just from a generational standpoint as, as this new kind of gold mine, but also a very different way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> how can we reach that audience much more authentically as a brand versus just advertising, just advertising, just advertising? Um, what can we do that goes much more uh, deeper than just surface level? I think that's very interesting. And it, as, as we talked and we prepped a little bit for this, as we were talking about the way that Gen Z wants to be involved, very because it, it actually correlates to some research that we've done on our side as we, we broke it down and, and particularly with a few of our advisors that do uh, engagement research and do it at, at places like Stanford. It does feel like uh, as a generalization, you know, millennials are um, not as strong in some of those characteristics. So for example, maybe there aren't some of the privacy and um, uh, millennials kind of be open with privacy, maybe like the Facebook generation, but Gen Z wants to be engaged just as you talked about. And for example, when it comes to data and I think being marketed to, there's a willingness to share, but it's got to be done for the right reason. There's, there's, there's got to be the right value exchange. And I think the word that we saw in the research was that Gen Z actually wants to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. with their data and with, with their engagement. So um, is that correlate to what you say? And in terms of, I guess, does this necessarily entail reaching out to the campuses in, in, in particular? Is that like a, a real focus uh, when you talk yeah. about Gen Z or how? I, I, it, it's, it's twofold for us, right? So um, we have two things that we do that really um, work for us. It's almost like beta tests. Um, on what we think can work, what um, what might not work, you know. So I think you know you have to fail a little bit in this space, but you gotta have to. You really have to do it quickly and just move on, right? And you take those learnings and you take them for whatever that next step might be. Um, so for us, um, we do a content creator network, and what that is is it's uh, a group of. Um, creators that have either interacted with GBL or they are um, <clears throat> people who just kind of fit the brand. Um, and we help, we use them to really help us develop content, right? So we think as marketers sometimes can be stuck in marketing mode very much so, um, but sometimes it gets very difficult to turn into, well, if I'm not over strategizing it from a marketing perspective, you know, what does a consumer really want? And the best place to go is to the consumer. Um, so we've been really a proponent of that content creators network um, where we really value both diversity with who is on camera and showing up on our feeds, but also who's behind the camera as well, because that is something um, that's inherently important uh, to the brand. But also, you know, going back to what you mentioned about campuses, um, you know, we are working on uh, campus ambassador programs because I think that that is a really um, interesting way uh, to get the brand in front of that audience, but we're doing it a little bit differently. Um, we're utilizing um, these great ambassadors that we have, these campus ambassadors, to help us navigate the world of TikTok, right? So we were talking a little bit about emerging channels. I don't necessarily think TikTok is so emerging now. Um, maybe at the consumer level, I think from the brand level, it's still emerging um, and how brands can get it right. But we're really um, interacting with, uh, with the students and these campus ambassadors, and they're helping us, you know, hey, you know, how can we talk about headphones in a more authentic way in this platform? How can we create content that feels relevant to you and your audience? Um, so they help us, um, you know, by uh, creating the content itself, but also talking strategy with us. And, um, and there's no better way to help figure out what that next step should be for you as a brand than really going to that consumer and taking those insights and taking and figuring out what that next step is. So that's one way, you know, we're using this kind of a emerging platform, at least for brands, 
um, and, and using Gen Z to really help guide us um, and learn more about them. But in the, in the process, they're also learning about marketing, they're learning about business. Um, so it becomes like a really, uh, almost like a reverse mentorship to a degree um, where they're helping us you know, navigate what uh, some of these newer waters are. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I think it, it sounds like it's, yeah, it's a win-win from the, um, from your perspective of the brand, but also the experience that the campus ambassadors get as a intern or something like that. Now, I guess a huge question that will come up, I'm sure is, so how did the strategy for campus ambassador recruitment change with the pandemic and, um, and the whole mix of school reopening, which we won't, I mean, I have, I have kids in school, so I've got perspective on school shutdowns that I think many working parents uh, share, but what, uh, how did, how did that change for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, right, so uh, initially this campus program, you know, we, we've, we've done it before, and it's been more of, hey, you can do different events on campus, right, different things with your friends, and, you know, they're going through something as well, right, and and um, what we decided to do for this one is exactly, you know, what, what I spoke about is just really using them to help develop that content, get that strategy side thinking, and really look at it more of like a mentorship type thing before, um, instead of something, you know, more along the lines of helping us sell the product in that piece. Um, so it's really, it's really more of a beta test for us. And, and the way that we found these ambassadors was really from, um, you know, looking at their social followings, looking at what kind of content that they created, um, you know, looking at, you know, who they are as individuals, right, and their interests and their passion points. And, um, and, and, uh, and that's how we would choose them and bring them into the fold. Um, they would go through a brand training, you know, we'd go through, they'd have access to us. And, and, you know, each week, they're doing these kinds of challenges and really helping, um, helping us navigate some of these waters. Wow. That's that. So was it um, literally kind of a one-to-one -one outreach uh, of that, that point? And was there, uh, did you develop a, a, a entire kind of training and, and onboarding, I would, I would call it? Is that yeah, I mean, it, it, part, part marketing and part uh, HR campaign, it, it, it sounds like. It, yeah, right. Because, um, you know, you really need to train them so that they know about the brand, you know, what the brand stands for once, because it helps them, you know, learn about us, but it also helps them just from um, the standpoint of talking about, you know, product or different features, um, those kinds of things, which, which it helps with, but also, you know, just expectations, right? When, when you're representing on behalf of a brand, there's certain expectations that, you know, come into play and, and how you represent yourself, right? And, um, and then also, you know, some of the nitty gritty about disclosures and things like that on the legal side, which are great things for them to learn, right? As they, as they move through, you know, what may be marketing, what might be something else that they choose to go into, these are all things that are really helpful. But yes, we create a whole brand training for them. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, they have some great questions associated with that. And, um, and it's, it's a great learning experience for all of us. I'm chuckling because you may hear some uh, kids noise in the background here. I think that's a, a common <laughs> theme for, for many. I know that uh, well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if I'm lucky, you won't hear about a dog too much. But what about just so high level as as you saw that roll out and, and how long has that program been going on? Uh, this has been kind of, I, I would say it's like 2.5, right? So still a little bit newer. Um, and, you know, the adaptation, of course, um, with everything that happened last year, but, you know, it's one of those things that you constantly evolve and, and you change with what's happening in the world, right? So, um, you know, we're hoping it's something that can go for, for a long time and, you know, be successful and, and, you know, that we can measure that success, whether it's how we, um, how we formulate content for Gen Z to, you know, whatever the pieces might be, you know, post, uh, post pandemic world and, and what this program looks like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with 2.5 years, you kind of almost half and half of pre-pandemic world uh, and then in pandemic world. Um, any, any like just really high level trends you'd share in terms of how 
you saw the campus ambassadors change in their engagement once COVID rolled out versus pre and post and, and, and what I mean, like in terms of types of content or, or just even amount and, and the support, I mean, there, there must've been, uh, I, I, there must've been some interesting trends. I mean, I, I'll hold off on guessing uh, what it was, but anything just very, very high level. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're trends, right? Because it's, it's, um, each amb ambassador is an individual, right? And, and what their comfort level is going to be different, you know, and, and how they express themselves on this. I think what I saw as a really great trend is how much the ambassadors wanted to connect with each other across schools, right? And learn more about um, who, their, who their partner ambassadors would be, whether it's, you know, at Arizona State or, you know, at um, uh, University of Florida, like they all just wanna connect, you know, they're like, how can we, can we start, you know, a WeChat group? Like what else can we do here to gain that connection and, and gain more people really into their network that they can mm -hmm. learn from? Um, so uh, I found that, you know, really interesting in, in, in um, wanting to make sure that they stayed connected um, outside of just what, you know, we were giving them as challenges, um, but more so of, you know, how they can stay connected post this and during this, um, you know, to really help bring the program to life. Mm -hmm. Great. So thinking a little bit differently here, we were talking about the kind of camp, the campus ambassadors and really the outreach from, from there, from your view, changing perspective a little bit, especially with so many marketers on this call. Can you talk a little bit about your own kind of internal, maybe education to, or, or you know, how your digital marketing and you've got a, you know, long time brand that has more traditional <laughs> channels, I'm, I'm sure as well with that mixes, but maybe anything kind of high level in terms of how, uh, how you kind of educate around you in terms of these emerging channels and, and what you, uh, uh, you know, how you ask to be factored into those overall plans and, and how you kind of you ed educate on, on what results are being delivered. I mean, that, I'm sure that's a constant, probably that a huge, you know, a huge part of your, your, uh, your work. Yeah. Really. I think what's, what's great is we have a, a fantastic insights team at, at Harmon that, you know, has really helped push us, you know, in, in measurement and figuring out the different insights, they do a fantastic job. And, and I think, you know, for, for us, you know, Harman is really a digital first um, company. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you think of companies that have been um, around for a long time, you know, that's not always the first thing that comes to mind. But if you think of the connected experience that Harman drives, um, that things like emerging channels, these emerging types of platforms, even just um, just thinking it specifically about the consumer, it's not necessarily a challenge to be able to, um, you know, talk about these emerging pieces, you know, where we think we might go, to be able to test these kinds of things. Um, so I think we're really fortunate, you know, in, in, in that regard is, you know, we're all really open and we want to do what's best for the brand, but also what's best for the consumer as well and, and how we can tell those stories and really truly connect with them. Um, so I think from, from that regard, you know, it's, it's, it's always an, an open conversation, which um, I know isn't always the case in, in, in other places. Um, so we know that we're really fortunate there and being able to, to really move the needle and bridge that gap, uh, you know, with culture for, for JBL. Great. Um, and you and I have a couple more minutes, I think, of just us chatting. And then there's like six or eight questions already in the Q&A. So we'll have a good chance for Q&A. And just to remind okay. folks in the audience, if you have a question for Katie, feel free to uh, to drop it in the Q&A. And I'm, I'm uh, looking for it. So so that's wonderful. I think one good question that came in that I would be fascinated is, you know, we talk about, I agree, you know, TikTok, I think, has broad awareness. And there is uh, probably other platforms that uh, you may already be de-emphasizing or you're not depending on it, but maybe just a little bit on how, um, how you monitor for the emerging trends that, that your, 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 your customers may want to engage with and kind of at what point do you decide uh, to engage? Like how, how do you keep your radar out and, and what are some of the, 
the metrics or the qualities that you look for in terms of, you know, at what point did TikTok uh, get your attention that way and how, how are you tracking that going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's interesting, right? Because it's kind of how um, how some uh, consumers really just learn about different products and things. It's really monitoring influencers and what they're doing and where they're going. It's it's monitoring thought leaders, you know, in the in the space as well, um, and and seeing what's being talked about, right? Like like Clubhouse, right? Like Clubhouse, you know, in Gen Z, you know, it's still out whether. Gen Z is something that um, they're going to really lean into Clubhouse. They may, from a career standpoint, and say, hey, I can talk to, you know, these different, you know, marketing leaders or finance leaders, or there's a Gen Z, you know, room that I want to join and that I, I, I speak to, right? So, you know, maybe, you know, they're looking at things like that, but we're really looking at, you know, influencers, what they're consuming and where they're headed. And then we're also um, just looking at just the world, right, itself. I know um, I go to Reddit sometimes and I look at Reddit and I can see some of the things that are happening as well, right, is from a, a trending uh, perspective and, you know, some of the conversations that begin there around certain technologies and things. So there's, um, so there's some interesting pieces there, but I'm, I'm of the mindset that you always need to have a learning mindset and you always need to be curious. So for me, it's going to these different places and learning about them, but also looking at, you know, the influential people and, and what they're talking about, how they're talking about it, and then how they're also using the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then from there, you know, we as a brand kind of need to take a look and say, you know, do you need to be everything to everyone and need to be everywhere? Or do you need to be really smart and really surgical about where you show up as a brand um, to make a, to make more of an impact. So we have to weigh those things. Mm -hmm. And how, how many, by the way, about like how many countries is Harmon um, selling into? I mean, I actually don't know the, the distribution globally. I would, well, it's a, it's a global company. I won't, don't know the number off the top of my head, yeah. but I, I imagine, you know, any uh, from, retailers like we talked about like the best buy and targets right you know some of those have a go global presence to you know distributors as well i mean we're, we're available globally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about in terms of your your team i'd say like your your direct team and, and then your your parallel uh we have kind of parallel internally but how do you um i, I say how do you structure internally and i guess the keeping keeping yourself educated and looking at influencers, but are there other you know particular types of skills or things that you're asking your folks to to develop or you know particularly track uh, now? What what yeah. what, what do you think you talk about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know when you first start off in the, in the business, I was at WWE before I, I came to to Harmon, and you know one one of the things is like very quick thinking, right? If you're living in the social digital world, it's very fast paced. You know, things are constantly changing. The message, you know, that you send from a brand may stay consistent, but the world around it is constantly changing. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, being prepared for that, you know, making strategic but quick decisions. Um, I also think another piece, which is a little bit more tactical, is being able to edit video and being able to do the small things like Photoshop work, which may seem small, um, but in the end, it ends up being very, very valuable, you know, in, in such a quick turn world, right, that we, that we live in, and as far as some of the content um, that gets put out. So I think just speaking more tactically, I think those things, you know, are, are super important to, to have on a, on a team um, to make sure that, you know, the, the vision that you have can, can come to life. And it's not just, you know, um, it's Harmon's vision, right, and, and, uh, and, you know, we're all, we're all one team, whether we work on sports or digital or, you know, PR, whatever it might be, it's all really one team that we, that we work under for really just, you know, uh, pushing that vision. And again, like striving to have um, GBL really be at the intersection of, of culture. Yeah, that's a great point. Like those, those little, little tactical things that can make a huge difference when you just need to get something done and not have to, uh, you know, wait for an outside party or something. That's, that's a really interesting um, 
a comment. Yeah, even photography, right? Like th things like that, yeah. right? If you're thinking, you know, going into into the pandemic, right? And and you know, sometimes you have agencies, sometimes it's it, it is a one person, you know, show where you are taking the photos, you are editing the videos. Well, all of those things, you know, going into a world where you couldn't have, you know, any of those kinds of commercial shoots or um, you know, things like that, those things become increasingly more important, you know, so, so not just, you know, define what your leadership skills are, but also those smaller skills can come into play big time, you know, as you move, move throughout, you know, your, your career. Some may say it's like maybe in the, in the weeds, but I think, you know, you have to, uh, you have to be able to do those things and keep those skills fresh, you know, to really keep moving along. I think there was a, uh, I was on a very interesting session, must've been October, November, but there was a, there was a marketer who like many, many in the consumer space, I think they saw, you know, a huge shutdown and a huge slowdown. There's my kids in the background. They get very <laughs> excited. Um, so in this case, this one particular marketer had seen it. I think they said literally in April and May of last year, it was a consumer product their revenue had gone to zero and then they were in the home improvement space um, and they had kept on working. But then as people focused on home improvement projects, all of a sudden the spigot got turned on. They actually had way more business than they could handle. And in that situation, they actually shut off all of their marketing spend because they just had so much organic demand. That was a fascinating discussion. Um, have you have you changed or you know like reallocated marketing spend dollars significantly or just any you know any big change in just actual spend over the last twelve months because either because of pandemic or just trends like I mean is it I mean I, I, yeah I think any brand you know is constantly evaluating what they do in the space, whether, you know, what they spend on, you know, in those pieces. So I think, you know, in, the, in that regard, we're, we're like, you know, the majority of brands, you know, when the pandemic hit is, is you, you reevaluate and figure out what you, what you need to do and what the next steps are. Are you from, are you, are you, as you're looking at social, I mean, are you looking at and, and tracking the um, the actual like e-commerce path to purchase points as well. Are you getting like yourself specifically like, getting into the the funnel? Or are you generally more fo focused on the awareness and the upper funnel? Um, uh, I, I, I think I think it's both, right? I think social um, social commerce is growing so much that you have to be able to not just meet the demands from an awareness perspective, but you also have to meet the demands that, you know, fall into more of the lower funnel as well. Um, so, you know, as, as, a, as a brand, you know, we, we, you track those things and you want to see, you know, what's, uh, where you might need to reevaluate. But I think, you know, as social commerce grows, um, it's increasingly important to be able to, to measure those pieces and, and how those things can track, um, you know, to the greater goal. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I, I, uh, I think anything from your, I, I don't know if it's like from your, your distributor retailers, like, you know, are, are you getting that data from the Best Buy pages to the social commerce? I mean, I think all of that together is probably, you know, fascinating data to, to track and be, to be aware of. So, let me see a few other questions have come in just on the, the Q and A. So you're getting lots of um, uh, interested folks wanting to, to hear on that. Um, yeah, I think there's, here's an interesting one, just in terms of uh, if you, if you, you, you think about Harmon as a, as a digital first brand, um, I wonder, you know, who we could define as a more legacy or, or true, like a heritage brand, I guess. And and I don't need looking at your background. I mean, is there is there a, a few things you could say as to what um, a digital first, you know, already marketing Gen Z brand? What, what advice would you give if if there was a, someone who's coming from much more of a traditional, I guess, you know, staid brand? I I don't know that they're. I don't know how. I, I'm kind of hard hard time thinking about who wouldn't be digital first today in terms of the the necessity of it, but um, any thoughts there? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think one, you, you have to know what your brand stands for, right? And, and what it stands for, for Gen Z, you know, what is that value set that you have? I think that that is um, super important and it is um, becoming increasingly, it is already um, increasingly important to Gen Z to have brands that um, not only, you know, say something, but then stand behind it, right? So it's really important for um, brands to make sure that they have, they know what their values are, they know what they stand for and what their purpose is. And I think that that is um, an, uh, a really good way to help you figure out how you can unlock what that next step is. Maybe it's influencers and how you use influencers, right? So making sure that the, the influencers that you work with um, align with that as well and, and those types of pieces. So I think, you know, really making sure that you have that bigger picture of who you are as a brand um, is going to help you market even better to Gen Z because, you know, that, that you know, are you being, um, are you being realistic here or are you just kind of like showboating and saying you're doing something or are you really doing something? Um, you know, that bar there, like Gen Z is going to find that and they're mm -hmm. going to call you out on it. So you want to make sure that you have, you know, all of those pieces um, in a really good spot. Um, and I think that'll unlock so much more um, for you to market to. It's just a, a, as a brand. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps without, you know, without letting out any secret sauce, but I'd be curious as to, I'm, I'm sure you're getting data on Gen Z or just influencers and a whole variety um, you know, from the platforms themselves, I'm sure that's part of the value prop. Can you talk a little bit about what alternative sources of data you're using to kind of fact check what the platforms themselves are telling you about these influencers or categories? You know, is it anything from opinion polling or survey polling to other tracking, uh, you know, uh, tracking platforms. And again, you don't, I don't want you, you don't have to name any specific tech that you're using or for, but I don't give that away, but just. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say this is that we have a really holistic approach to, to insights that, you know, measure things, you know, short and long term and what the impacts are. So, you know, from, from that standpoint, you know, we're really able to glean insights that can help us in the interim, but then also help us in the, in the long term to really help inform that strategy. Okay, great. I'm sure that is long developed and is uh, quite a bit invested in that. So, well, great, Katie. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. And I'm actually eager to check out some of the videos. I'm going to go out and find them uh, on TikTok. And <laughs> great. That'd be great. Thank so. you. Cool. By the way, I do not have my own TikTok channel. I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm more of an observer through my children. Yeah. <laughs> Love TikTok. Um, well, thanks so much, Katie and Timur, for kicking us off today. Really interesting session. Um, you know, Katie, I, I loved how you, you know, you talked about your your um, ambassador program, and you know, I think Timur, you pointed out just a probably a really challenging time right now. Um, but what an interesting space and a great way you guys have approached it right, from uh, really taking a deeper dive into the individuals who you've brought in to make sure that they're relevant to your brand, which I'm sure has really paid off in dividends to make sure that they're, you know, vested in what it is that you're doing. So kudos to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, well, again, thanks so much. Um, we're going to head to our next Fireside Chat of the Day. Um, we're going to be joined by John Starkweather, who is the AVP.